Well, it's really great to be with you this morning. I've got one of those strange accents you sometimes hear on TV. But one of the things you can say is that the Gospels are reliable and there are so many reasons. I just want to give you three. The geography, the Jewishness, and Jesus. Okay? Geography, Jewishness, and Jesus. I could have given you more, but this is just a short time. Before I came here, I really didn't know what the layout of Liberty University would be. Because before you've been to a place, you just don't know. But what you find is when you look at the Gospels, they really know the layout of the land very well. They know where the land goes up and down. They know traveling distances. They know the names of towns. Each of the four Gospels has 12 to 14 different towns mentioned. And some of them are quite obscure places. Places like Bethany or Bethphage. If you were just making up a story, living in a different country, wanting to write about Jesus, how would you know about little villages? You couldn't go to a bookshop and find out about them, but they've got that. When you look in the Gospels, you also find that they have far more place names than you would find in apocryphal Gospels. You know about apocryphal Gospels that some of the conspiracy theorists think you ought to have in the Bible? Well, I investigated some of those. I looked at the 16 earliest apocryphal Gospels. And what did I find out about their place names? Well, 13 of them didn't have a single town name in. And then there were a couple that had one town name, and that was Jerusalem. And then there was the most high-scoring apocryphal Gospel. It was the Gospel of Philip. And do you know it had two place names? One was Jerusalem, the capital, which isn't very impressive. And the other one was Nazareth, which it thought was Jesus' middle name. So that wasn't very good. You look in the Gospels, you find the four Gospels have five place names per thousand words. All four Gospels. You can go and check it. They have an amazing evenness of spread. Now I think that if someone was putting in place names to make it sound authentic through some deliberate action, one would put in too many, one would put in too few. But we find that though there's four different authors, they have the same spread because they're not trying to put in place names to make it sound authentic. They're just naturally reporting. Secondly, the Jewishness of the Gospels. The Gospels are incredibly Jewish. When Christianity began, everyone be agrees it began in the cradle of Judaism. The earliest Christians were all Jews. But then, thankfully, they let Gentiles in. I am just so glad of that. Is anyone else here glad of that? <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Now, but what happened is very quickly the church becomes very Gentile. Now, if you were writing a, a gospel a long time after it all began, you would write a Gentile gospel. You would write about a Gentile Jesus. But guess what? The more you look at the gospels, the more Jewish you find Jesus is. The more the gospels are concerned about the Old Testament. Apocryphal gospels you find aren't concerned about the Old Testament. All four gospels are. And that brings me on to the third great reason to believe the Gospels, and that is the person of Jesus Christ, who is a really incredible figure. I think it'd be really good for you to go home and to write a list of all of the independent, remarkable things about Jesus. Because what you find is there are just an awful lot of them. Now, some people say, well, how do we know they all happened? Well, let's say you don't. But... If he didn't make up those amazing parables, it's really lucky that he had such great disciples as to make up the parables and then attribute them to him. You know, it's a bit like, do you imagine some great professor and you say, well, actually, you know where that professor got where he is? It's because his students wrote all the papers for him. Well, I've not heard of that happening. Or, or the fact that Jesus was the first person to come up with the clearest form of the golden rule that you should do unto others what you'd have them do to you. No one came up with anything like that before, and he came up with that. Or maybe a disciple came up with it and put it on his lips. But either way, it's a pretty lucky thing about Jesus. And then you find that he's got this most amazing resurrection. It's not just that there's a body disappeared, it's that you also have appearances of Jesus, not at a distance, but sometimes at a distance, sometimes close up to groups of two to five hundred, groups of men, groups of women, in the morning, in the evening, in the town, in the countryside, indoors, outdoors, in Galilee, in Judea, up a hill and by a lake. The variety of appearances is amazing. And Jesus appears not just standing, but sitting and walking 
and always eating and always talking. It's such an amazing thing. And yet, that didn't just happen to anyone. It happened to someone about whom we know there are remarkable teachings, more miracles recorded than about anyone else, and a great message about how he died for our sins. It's great to be here this morning. Thank you.